Hello, we're going to continue our study from the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I gave an introduction in the last lesson, and uh, I did read the first verse, and I'm going to reread that, but we're going to talk about the first part of this first chapter, which I would call the prologue. It's where Solomon begins to talk about his subject. He's not going to be exhaustive in the prologue. He's going to just give us an introduction, and it's going to go for several verses. But let's look at the first verse that we looked at last time. He says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Well, we talked about that last time, about how I take this to be Solomon. There are others who will take it in other ways, but I do take this to be Solomon. And so that's his, you might say, his opening statement in identifying himself. But then he goes into this prologue, which begins in verse 2 in this way. He says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now that's an interesting beginning. Well, let's talk about that word, vanity. Uh, the Hebrew word speaks of breath. It can speak of something fleeting. It can speak of something that evaporates. And really the, the idea behind it is something that cannot be grasped. Now, some translations may say worthlessness, worthlessness, or meaningless, meaningless, but it really is a fleetingness. Now, when he says vanity of vanities, he is saying this is the greatest vanity. It's like saying the mother of all battles or something like that, or the, the greatest of all baseball players. When he says the vanity of vanities, he says this is the greatest vanity. And what is this vanity of vanities? It's that all is vanity. Now, it's an interesting kind of circular statement, but his point is the greatest vanity is the fact that everything is vanity. Everything is fleeting. Nothing is permanent in this life. Now, I want to remind you what I said in the last lesson, that in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is not talking about eternal rewards or eternal punishment. He will hint toward that in some places. So Solomon is talking about life in this fallen world and how to live life in a fallen world. And we would understand if you are a Christian that we are Christian people living in a fallen world, a world in which sin is very commonplace and rebellion against God is commonplace. And the fact that because of the fall, things have happened in this world that create problems. God told Adam that this would happen, said you'll cultivate your ground and it'll bring up weeds. You don't have to plant weeds. And that's just another aspect of what happened with the fall. So living in a fallen world is difficult. And so that's this is the focus of Solomon, that there is a fallen world. There are things about this fallen world that make life very difficult, and we have to find a way to live in it. And so he's going to be talking very practically about this. So he says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does verse uh, 3 what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. So he says there is a cycle to life. And what does a man get who toils? Well, there is some temporal benefits, obviously. If I work, I make a living for my family. I don't starve. I support my family. I give an example of good work and all of that. But here's the great equaler that Solomon will eventually point to. At the end, we all die. And so what becomes of all that work? It goes into nothingness. So understand, 
once again, Solomon is not talking about eternity. He will say in a portion of Ecclesiastes, it will be well for the man who obeys God. But he does not dwell on that because he's talking about life in this world. So what does a man get from his toil? Well, he gets a temporal benefit, but really no eternal benefit from it. There's, I mean, eventually he dies in this world. He said the sun rises and the sun goes down. There is a cycle to to life every day. The sun rises, the sun goes down again. It's been doing that way for thousands of years. People who have lived and have been dead for a long time watched the same sun rise and watched the same sun go down again. He goes on, he said, a generation comes and a generation goes. People live, people die. You know, we tend to have such a focus on the here and now that we think, oh, this is, we're the greatest generation that's ever lived. Uh, we're the most wise generation, but we are just part of a long litany of generations that have come and gone on this earth. He says the sun rises, the sun goes down. It's just once again, this, this cycle. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and round goes the wind, and on the circuits, the wind returns. There is a cycle to the winds. There's a cycle to the weather. I know we're being told by a lot of people that we have this human-generated climate change. But we've always had climate change. There has always been climate change. The real question is whether humans have generated it, and I won't get into that. But the fact is, there is a cycle to things. I was reading something the other day. Someone had posted a picture of the sun. It's This is why it's so hot, because it's much more active. Well, the sun goes through solar cycles, and about every 11 years or so, it reaches a maximum, and then it goes down. So, yes, there's a cycle to that, and it's always been that way. Not only in our time, it's been that way in other times. So there is a cycle to life. The fact that we have a news media that reports every single thing as if it is the new thing that has never happened before does not discount, discount the fact that everything has happened before. He says, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. You got rivers, run to the sea. You see uh, uh, any place where water is running that water is going to find its way. If it's a creek, it's going to find its way to a river. And then that river is going to eventually find its way back to the sea. He said, yet, yeah, but the sea is not full. Why? Because there is a cycle. The sun evaporates seawater. The seawater comes onto land. The, the rains fall. And then the water flows back to the sea. So it, there is a cycle that has been going on for thousands of years. The sea is not filled up. The sea has not gone down. It's a continual cycle. But then he says in verse 8, All things are full of weariness. Man cannot utter it. All things are filled with weariness. And he's talking about the fact that life has a certain amount of repetition and drudgery to it. It's a wearying thing. There's much good in life, and Solomon would never deny that. And he's going to he's going to enjoin people within this teaching of Ecclesiastes to seek those good things and enjoy those good things. But there is a weariness to the cycle of life. It says again in verse eight, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. We're never satisfied. We're never satisfied with what we see. We're never satisfied with what we hear. It's just a part of our nature. And he says, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And that sounds like a circular statement, but his point is this. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's been done that, that's going on now has been going on for thousands of years. Yes, there's technological advancement. There are things we have. The fact that I'm 
teaching through a video presentation that's going to go out on the internet is obviously obviously an advancement that has been made in something that was not around even a few years ago. But when you but there's always been technological advancement. There's always been a moving forward in technology. If you just go to farming and fertilization and farming methods and using different kinds of plows throughout human history there has been advancement but nothing has really changed he says what will be done is what has been done we can also say that what's going to happen in the future is going to be a repetition of the things that have happened in the past because the world has not changed humanity has not changed and this is the nature and the cyclical part of life. He said, there is nothing new under the sun. And truly, that is correct. Nothing new under the sun. He says, verse 10, is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. People are saying that all the time. This is new. We've never seen this before. He said, it has been already in the ages before us. Virtually everything that happens, virtually every idea that people come up with today, someone has thought of it before. Usually in many, 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 many years in the past. And there's a cycle of ideas because human minds work the same. And a human mind that is not receiving instruction from the Word of God is going to follow down the same path that previous human minds that did not receive instruction from the Word of God followed. So he said, there's nothing new. You know, there's new technology. There's new ways of doing things that change. But the basis of who we are and the basis of how we think and the basis of what motivates us is the same that it has always been. And he says, there is no remembrance of former things. Now, this is a uh, quite <laughs> true fact. I'm a history teacher. I'm a lover of history. Uh, very few people know anything about history. And very few people are interested in anything about history. And so what Solomon says here, there is no remembrance of the former things. Most people don't care. They're just interested in what's going on in their life now. Now, that's understandable to a degree, but here's the problem. When we don't learn from the past, we repeat the errors of the past. And so often people think, yeah, that, that was a mistake they made in the past, but we're going to do it right this time. And everyone thinks that. So there's no remembrance of the past. And this is just a human nature. There are those of us who, are, who love history, and so we're kind of locked into the past because it's just a love of ours. But most people don't think that way. And he says, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be. He said, when new things come on, come upon us, when we have new happenings in the world, after those new happenings take place, there will be no remembrance of them. Think about us. Our lives are very important to us. But when we die, our immediate family will remember us. Maybe our grandkids will remember us, but then the cycle of years will pass and nobody will remember that we ever existed. If you want to attest that, think about people in the past that you knew. You remember them to a certain extent and they've died. You know of them. Think about people that were famous in history in the, say, the last 30 or 40 years. Well, those of us who are older remember them. The younger generation comes up and they don't know who an Eisenhower is. They may read something about him. They don't know who a Kennedy is. They don't even know who a Reagan is so often. And I'm just using political figures as an example because there's no remembrance. And that's just the nature of life. There's a great story that happened 
there was a Greek warrior by the name of Xenophon. And in around the period of 400 BC, he and his 10,000 man mercenary army hired themselves out to one of the Persian kings. The Persians were actually having a civil war between two brothers. And so he hired himself out to one of the kings. Well, it didn't work out. Uh, the king eventually died. Uh, the army had to get back to Greece. And so basically they had to fight their way back to Greece. And so he wrote this account of this, this uh, journey. It was called his Anabasis, his journey. And in that, he spoke of encountering this ruin of a city. He came upon the city that was very large, but it was a ruin. And, and the people around the area didn't even remember the name of the city. They didn't get the name right. Where he was, was the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Nineveh, the city that Jonah went to, Nineveh was destroyed in 600, 612 B.C. And so that was a little over 200 years before Xenophon came through there. So he comes through there. The city is a, This huge city is a ruin. No one even remembers what the name was. So that's the point. That what will be, or what has been, will not be in remembrance. What will be eventually that we're doing now will fall into disremembrance. And what will happen in the future will eventually do the same thing. So there is a cycle to life. There's a weariness to life. And he said, these things will not be remembered. So we need to remember that life has a fleeting nature to it. And we're talking about life in this world. The eternal, the eternal Things that we must consider are of utmost importance because we will spend eternity somewhere and Solomon will get to that. And I don't want to give you the last little bit of the, of the book of Ecclesiastes just to kind of show you that eternal focus that he will have. At the very end, the last two verses, he says this. He says, the end of the matter. All has been heard... Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So he does get to an eternal focus, but the whole subject of this book that we're going to look at is how then do we live in this fallen world that has things that just sometimes don't fit, that has things that do not work, and where what we think should be right does not happen? So Solomon deals with this because the world is not often the way we would want it to be, and what we think is justice does not always happen. So how do we live with this? And how do we live in such a world? Well, that's what Solomon is going to talk about in the book of Ecclesiastes as we go forward from here. So in this lesson, he talks about everything being fleeting, everything being vanity, because this life comes for all of us, whether we live a long time or a short time, we're eventually going to die. We're going to die. All of our labor on this earth will eventually go away. And eventually, no one will remember that we were ever here. So how do we live with that? Well, we, have, we keep an eternal focus, but we also learn to live in this life in a way that pleases God. And that's what we're going to go to next as we talk.